Is My Business Working For Me? An Accountable Guide on How to Structure Your Business. Holly has been growing fresh fruit and vegetables for her family to eat. When she has extra left over, she takes them down to the local market to sell in the hope of getting some of the costs back. Is it a business or a hobby? Do you? Charge others for the work you do? Make things to sell or work for people regularly at least every week? Intend to make a profit from your work? Organise your work as though you are running a business? Create adverts to promote your work? Do work for people other than friends or family? If you answered yes to at least two of these, you are probably running a business. Otherwise, your activities will be classified as a hobby. Selling at the market does not count as a business as Holly is doing it irregularly and not doing it for profit. So the money she makes there does not count as business income and is included with her personal income for end of year tax. Holly decides to start growing extra produce with the desire to sell it and puts an advert in the school newspaper to let people know when she will be at the market. Now she no longer counts it as a hobby and must follow the responsibilities of a sole trader or set up a company. Why should I become a sole trader? It's easier to set up than a company, though companies aren't that difficult to set up in New Zealand. It costs a little less to set up than a company. If a business makes a loss, then you can take that loss off your personal income to reduce the tax you pay. Why shouldn't I become a sole trader? Because the business is considered part of you, you can't sell it to someone else or leave it to someone in a will. You have what is referred to as a liability. This means that everything you personally own is considered part of the business, so if the business can't pay its debts, you could lose your stuff. Even if you don't think you have much of value, that doesn't mean debt collectors won't come and try and take anything they can carry and sell to get back money. After learning what is required to be a sole trader, Holly decides to talk to her father Steve to see if he is considered making a company himself. Steve and a fellow plumber had formed a partnership to split their advertising costs, but his partner is thinking of retiring, so Steve has been wondering if it is worth changing to a company structure. Should I use a partnership? A partnership works like a sole trader, except you have at least one other person to own and run the business with. This allows you to split the costs and the workload of running the business and gives you someone else you can talk to about the business before making decisions. There are set up costs because you must create a partnership agreement. The partnership only exists because of this agreement. You still have personal liability, like a sole trader, except now you must rely on the other partners to not run the business into the ground to not lose your stuff. Or even worse, there is a chance a dishonest partner will just disappear and leave a massive debt you are now liable for. What about a limited partnership? A limited partnership is a relatively new type of business structure that was added to New Zealand law in 2008. At least one of the partners must be a general partner and they have the same personal liability as if it was a normal partnership. The other partner can be what is called a limited partner, which means that they do not have the liability that sole traders and general partners do, so their personal assets are protected from business debts. These partners can provide financing to the partnership, but cannot take part in management decisions or else they will become general partners too. After talking to Holly, Steve realises just how much risk there is to the family home without some sort of insurance or mortgage protection, so he decides to look into whether a company suits his situation better. Why should I form a company? The owners of a company, known as shareholders, are separate from the business and are not liable for their business debt if it fails. All you lose is the value of the shares you had in the company and any money you owe the company, such as unpaid shares and drawings. Ownership of a company can be transferred to someone else by selling them the shares or by transferring the shares to them in a will. Why shouldn't I form a company? It requires some understanding to set one up and requires extra record keeping for financial statements. There are some expenses required for compliance costs or for paying for help with setting one up and record keeping. Your company must have someone in charge, known as a director, who has obligations to run the business in an appropriate manner, which is known as acting in good faith. Trading when you already can't afford to pay your debts can make you liable as a director. Shareholders can also be held to directors' liabilities if they do not monitor the directors or are given powers that would normally only be used by a director. After thinking about this, Steve decides the responsible thing to do is form a company. That way he can make sure the family home is protected from the ups and downs of his business. 
While he had intended to invite his partner to create the company with him, his partner instead decides he will take that retirement that he's been considering. Luckily, a company can be formed with just one person, so Steve makes a company where he is the sole shareholder and director. How do I form a company? Step 1. Register your company and its name with the company's register, which will also give you a New Zealand business number. Step 2. If your turnover will be over $60,000, you must also register for GST. Step 3. Optionally, register your logo as a trademark if you want to protect it. Step 4. Create a constitution for your company if you do not want to use the rules in the legislation. If you are unsure whether you need any of these, then ask a local small business advisory service who will ensure you form the company that best suits your needs. Holly isn't worried about being liable for anything because her expenses are so small and she doesn't want to have to worry about the extra setup and record keeping. She does need someone to take over for her work when she's overseas so looks into hiring staff. Steve offers to make her business a part of his company and hire Holly as a staff member. Then, while she is away, he can hire someone else. If you want to hire staff. If you intend to hire staff, you must register with Inland Revenue as an employer. There will be obligations you need to meet as an employer, even as a sole trader. You should make sure to prepare a proper contract and ask the staff to sign it before they start. If you want the staff member to be on a 90-day trial, then they must have signed the contract before they enter the place of work before their first shift, or you will not be able to enforce it. If you have insurance, then you must tell the insurance company that you now have staff. You will have to create a file to keep track of your new staff's details, as well as a record of their work history. Make sure your new staff know about your policies and how you expect them to behave. Steve needs to promote the new company, but discovers there is a company with a similar name to his partnership, who has been gaining business from Steve's good reputation. He wonders how the company was able to use the name when he had been using it for years before they had opened. What is my intellectual property? When you are running a sole trader or partnership, it is possible for someone else to use the same business name as you. You can get some legal protection by registering your trading name with the intellectual property office, but it is difficult and expensive to protect. When you create a company, you must register the company's name with the company's register. No two companies can have the same name, and you can stop a sole trader or partnership from using your name. Holly has come back from her holiday with tons of ideas of how to grow Steve's company. A friend notes that Steve is just blindly following all his suggestions, and suggests that she might as well be a director despite not wanting to be part of running the company. Am I a director without meaning to be? It is possible to count as a director if you are giving instructions that are obeyed as if they came from a director. This means that you can be held to the same obligations as a normal director and possibly the same liability despite the company not officially listing you as a director. When you give instructions and they are obeyed by the company as if they were given by a director, then you are a de facto director. When you tell a director what they should do and they pass on the instructions to be acted on exactly as you said them, then you are a shadow director. There is a thin line between providing advice and becoming a shadow director. It is easy to gain a director's liability when you are just trying to be helpful. One of Steve's suppliers has asked him to make a personal guarantee against any money he owes them in the future. This sounds fair enough, but there is a lot of legal wording, so he decides to get some advice on what it actually means. Personal guarantees. When you make a personal guarantee, it is a legal promise to repay money. This can make you liable for business debts to that supplier, just as though you were a sole trader. Personal guarantees don't go away with the business. Even if you sold the business to someone else, if your signature is on the personal guarantee, then the supplier can come after you. If you do want to give a supplier a personal guarantee, make sure to check the wording on how much you could be liable for. This could be a dollar value or other security items such as a mortgage on your home. The length of the guarantee and if it can be cancelled and if anyone is able to change any of these terms. The personal guarantee may not be easy to read and understand, so if you're at all unsure, get some advice from a business or legal specialist before signing.
It's the end of the financial year, and because Holly was a sole trader during part of it, she knows that she needs to tell IRD what she earned and wonders how her expenses affect her tax. Sole trader, end of financial year. Your business income and expenses will be included on the IR3 tax return you file as an individual. After your first year, you will have to pay provisional tax if your tax bill for the last year was over $2,500. This is a way of prepaying your tax bill across the year so that you don't have one big payment at the end. It is estimated based on the previous year's tax and at the end of the year you only pay the difference between your total tax for the year and the provisional tax you've already paid. You automatically will be on ACC Cover Plus and can choose to go to Cover Plus Extra if you want more control. IR3. What do I need? You will need records of your business and personal income and expenses for the year, including scheduler payments, which is what you paid to contractors depending on how they pay their tax, any interests or dividends you were paid and any tax you already paid on those, any overseas income, any rental income, any other income. Make sure to get a New Zealand business number. They are becoming the standard to identify you when interacting with the government and other businesses. Steve still has to pay tax from when his partnership was still going. This is a little different to Holly's obligations. Partnership, end of financial year. You file an IR7 as a partnership. Like a sole trader, after your first year, you'll have to pay provisional tax if your tax bill for the last year was over $2,500. After your first year, you'll have to pay provisional tax like a sole trader. You will automatically be on ACC Cover Plus and you can choose to go to Cover Plus Extra if you want more control. The profit and tax to pay for the partners is split amongst them according to how it is set out in the partnership agreement. IR7. Just like a sole trader, you will need records of your business and personal income and expenses for the year, including scheduler payments, which is what you pay to contractors depending on how they pay their tax any interest or dividends you were paid and any tax you already paid on those, any overseas income, any rental income and any other income. Just like a sole trader, make sure to get a New Zealand business number. These are becoming the standard number to identify you when interacting with the government and other businesses. Now Steve has a company that has different end of year obligations. Company, end of financial year. File your financial statements after the end of the financial year. If your revenue and expenses for the year are less than $30,000, you don't have to prepare financial statements. File an IR4 tax return by the 7th of July, assuming you're using the 31st of March as the date for the end of the financial year. If you have an IRD approved tax agent, you have much longer to file your tax return. Up to the 31st of March the following year, if that is the date of your end of the financial year, though a good tax agent will file it much quicker than that. IR4. What do I need? You will need records of your business and personal income and expenses for the year, including any interest or dividends you were paid and any tax you already paid on those, any business, rental or other income, any tax credits, any allowable deductions, and any previous losses that you can bring forward. Steve thinks of a way to avoid paying as much tax. He could have the business pay for a vehicle rather than buy it himself. That way he can use it to reduce business tax and he doesn't have to pay income tax on the money himself. Fringe benefit tax. When an employee receives a benefit from his employer that is not cash, it is called a fringe benefit. Depending on the nature of the fringe benefit, the company may have to pay tax to prevent them being used as a way to avoid the employee's tax burden. A ute, van or truck that is sign written can be claimed as an expense because it does not count as a fringe benefit for certain work uses. But if it is available for personal use, there will be at least a portion of its expenses that is considered fringe benefit. A car is never considered a work vehicle and the company will have to pay fringe benefit tax on any expenses related to a car provided to an employee. After finishing his end of year commitments, Steve looks at the pile of invoices, receipts and records he has carefully filed in a pile at the bottom of a box and wonders how much of that is rubbish and how much he has to keep. What records to keep? You must keep your company records for seven years. This includes any company correspondence such as board meeting minutes, copies of communications with shareholders, 
and any resolutions or certificates that have been issued. Copies of all the financial statements have to be kept, and you have to keep a record of all the company's assets and liabilities. Consider using online storage to back up your documents so that they are safe and can be accessed easily by services you authorise. Steve and Holly were able to avoid easy mistakes because they got advice. Now that things are running smoothly, they can focus on decisions that will grow their business. It can be hard to admit that we do not always know the best options for any decision, but there is no shame in seeking advice. The team at Accountable are small business specialists who can answer all of your questions and help you stay on the right track. Give them a call today or check out their website accountable.co.nz